Thank you for tuning in to the Cozy Mystery Quartet podcast. I am joined by Wendy Kendall, Susan McCormick, and Linda Hope Lee. We're learning more about the characters in our books this week, so I thought I would let the irascible Susie speak for herself. Hey everyone, I'm Crystal's co-worker, Susie Hawkins. Crystal and I are a dynamic duo when on assignments together. I rock climbed and summited mountains before I could drive and can thrive in nature no matter the condition. However, that's not all the job calls for. We also need to educate our clients on the excursions while keeping them entertained, and that's where I kind of suck, but only because people make me want to punch them as a general rule. Crystal isn't very experienced at outdoor guide activities, but she's a people person and does all the hand-holding while I demonstrate all the fun stuff we get to do. I know everyone wants to hear about Crystal's adventures, but she's actually busy solving a murder. I'll bring you up to speed on how the sleuthing is going, but it's anyone's guess when life will return to what passes for normal's forest wilderness guide. On our last outing, our friend, the camp hostess Roxy, was thrown in the slammer for the death of her boss, the one and only Frederick Berenhoff, wealthy owner of the unique wilderness properties where we host our excursions. If you knew Roxy at all, you'd know there was no way she did it. Besides, there are a ton of other suspects the police ignored that need investigating, all who want to exploit the old growth forest on the property. I wanted to accuse people of committing the murder and wait for a confession. My plan was met with skepticism, so we haven't put it into action. Crystal, though? First, she broke into a logging company's job shack to investigate whether they were behind the death. After being run off the property by a, the rifle-toting owner, she didn't back down. She cooked up a new scheme and imitated a newspaper reporter to score an interview with a wealthy developer who also had her eyes on Baron House property. I got to witness firsthand how clever Crystal was when she worked the woman for information. She had the developer buying her story hook, line, and sinker. For a little while, anyway. When the woman figured out we were frauds, she was six types of furious. Still, I thought it was excessive to call the cops to kick us off her property. We would have just left, if she asked nicely. Duty called, and I had to cut out to host an overnight hiking trip on the coast. By the time I got back, Crystal greeted me with one heck of a story. Turns out, She'd been arrested for stalking the developer and spent the night in freaking jail. This girl makes my determination to climb Mount Rainier look like a passing fancy, even if she could do with a permanent baby babysitter to keep her out of trouble. Crystal thinks we're close to the truth, but close doesn't count when it comes to solving a murder. We're going to have to continue taking risks to get to the bottom of this. Susan, can you introduce us to your medical intern, Dr. Sarah James? Thank you, Michael. I'm going to interview Sarah, a main character for my Fog Lady series. This is part of a full interview posted in Drew's Book Musings. How old are you, Sarah? 28, which is half a century younger than my fellow Fog Ladies. What's your profession? I'm a medical resident in a hospital in San Francisco, now in my second year of three years of an internal medicine residency. Do you have any children? No, I barely have a boyfriend. But I'm around a little guy all the time, one-year-old baby Owen, Alma Gordon, older woman who lives in my building, takes care of an abandoned baby left over from one of the Fog Ladies' charity activities, waiting for his mother to return. I should explain about the Fog Ladies. They've been meeting for over a decade, growing larger as each woman became a widow. I'm actually the one who named them the Fog Ladies. Frances Noonan told me you can count on them like you can count on early morning fog. San Francisco weather's a constant, and so are the Fog Ladies. I'm a Fog Lady now, too, inviting in, invited in as we all grew closer over this past year. Murder does that to you. Who's your best friend? Helen, a fellow medical resident. She and her husband are having a little trouble because Scott's working on his PhD and they're expecting a baby. Scott will be the sole ter caretaker. He's worried he'll never finish his PhD. I never dreamed a murder we fog ladies are working on could ever endanger Helen and her new family, but unfortunately, that's what happens. Do you have any hobbies? No, I'm a medical resident. I don't even have time to read a book. The last novel I read was on a weekend between rotations when I went to a family resort in Big Sur. That's when I met the man who supposedly killed his wife with kitchen shears. I don't believe it. I'm hoping the fog ladies can help me prove him innocent. What's your favorite vacation spot? Well, I would have said the family resort in Big Sur. I took Alma Gordon, Mr. Glenn, and Baby in there, and I took Helen and Scott. But I think I better stop recommending it because everyone who goes there ends up dead. Do you have a favorite book? Ha! Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine. I read it every day. If you were to write a memoir, what would you call it? 
How I Hung Out with Women Three Times My Age, Solved Murders, and Ate Well, All While Becoming a Doctor. Are you an amateur or a professional sleuth? The Fog Ladies are a bunch of old ladies with too much time on their hands, and me, a doctor with no time for sleuthing, we're definitely amateurs. In a few sentences, what's a typical day in your life like? I get up before six, get to the hospital about seven, get home about seven, hope Mrs. Noonan sees me and invites me to dinner, eat a lovely meal with her, watching the sunset on the bay, hear about the Fog Ladies' latest suspicions, go home with a doggy bag of lemon squares, read up on patient case, cases from the day, hope I didn't miss any diagnoses, and fall asleep by midnight. Thank you for the interv interview, Sarah James from the Fog Ladies. Wendy, who did you bring today? For today's episode, I'm shining the spotlight on Jason Holmes and his police work. He's with the Bayside Police a patrol officer with a partner named Hobbs, a highly capable, very well-trained canine officer and a German shepherd. Jason is a veteran of the Afghanistan war where he also partnered with an amazing service dog named Robbie. Jason loves the excitement and dedication of working with his dog partner. He enjoys the chase and search. As the author, I learned about this police work directly from interviewing officers in the suburbs of Seattle. I also went on a ride along. I incorporated some of what I learned in the book through Jason and Hobbs. For example, did you know that rain is not an obstacle for police dog work? Good thing in the Seattle area. Police dogs are tracking dead skin cells shed by people. These have a personal imprint of their scent plus may include other identifiers like perfume. Dogs can be trained to follow this scent. As the police dog follows the trail, the canine has to focus and ignore any other scents. Dead skin cells can float on top of a water surface, so suspects can be tracked over water. Rain is actually an advantage because then the shed cells stay in place. The drizzly rain around Seattle is the best, but if it turns into a downpour, that's not helpful. You can hear about my ride along on YouTube's Kendall and Cooper Talk Mysteries on the episode titled Riding with the Big Dog. Although Jason loves his job, he would like to become a detective. Once the immediate chase and search is over, Jason is expected to turn all evidence found and all information over to the assigned detective. And then he's off the case and on to the next patrol. It's hard for Jason to let it go, but that's his job. Jason meets Catherine Watson very early in the mystery cat out of the bag as he drives up to the crime scene with siren screaming, lights flashing, and dog barking while showing fierce white teeth. There's a spark between Jason and Catherine at first meeting, but that passes quickly when their initial personalities as cop and purse designer collide. One day at the library, Catherine sees the children's reading group, The Rough and Ready, where shy children readers practice reading to enthusiastic dogs. Hobbs is there, sitting with a relaxed Jason. Catherine's second meeting with them outside the library gets the spark flickering again. Jason says, Hobbs, meet Catherine Watson. Jason nudged the dog's front paw so that Hobbs would hold it up. Catherine laughed and took his paw in her hand to shake it. I'm delighted to make your acquaintance again, Hobbs. I confess I'm a cat person, but I won't hold that against you if you don't hold it against me. She put his paw down on the ground. Oh, Hobbs, show her what we think of cat people. And with a slight movement of Jason's hand, Hobbs was sitting up with both front paws out begging. That's his plea that you reconsider your pet position. Catherine laughed and petted the dog with both hands as he stood up on all fours now. She scratched behind an ear. Well, you are irresistible if you truly represent those of your ilk. I have a cat at home that would disagree, though. Oh, well, Hobbs likes cat people, but what do you think about cats, Hobbs? At Jason's subtle command, the dog lay down on the ground and covered his head with both his front paws and started whimpering. Catherine knelt down and scratched the back of the dog's head until he rolled over, and she switched to rubbing his tummy. 
One of his hind legs started twitching. That's very funny. You two should take your act on the road. Jason was smiling as he crouched down next to them. You have a very nice smile. As the author, I'll tell you, it's definitely not always this smooth between these two, but it's always interesting. Linda, how about your character feature? Thank you, Wendy. Although I am more pantser than plotter, I often know beforehand at least some of the characters who will appear in a particular story especially when writing the Nina Foster Cozy Mystery Series, I like to have various people in mind who could or will be suspects. In addition are the permanent residents in her life who will appear in each book. However, I love to be surprised when a character I have not thought of appears and turns out to have more than just a walk-on role. Such was the case with Cora Springer, who made an unplanned appearance in Book 3, Deadly Reunion. In this story, Nina and Stephen, her significant other, travel from their home in Richmond, Washington, to Parker's Landing, Idaho, to attend Stephen's high school reunion. Nina first meets Cora when she takes Stephen's niece, Katie, to the town's public library to choose books for a storytelling program. The librarian, who turns out to be Cora, helps them find just the right story. Both being librarians, Cora and Nina have much in common and they quickly relate. As Nina and Katie prepare to leave the library, Cora says to Nina, while you're in town I'd love to get together and compare notes. Nina agrees, and although by this time she is deeply involved in the mystery, she looks forward to spending time with Cora. A few days later, they have lunch and learn more about each other. Cora and her park ranger husband, Zell, are relatively new in town, having moved there from Chicago. After lunch, the two visit the local bookstore. Although Cora is not actively involved in helping Nina solve the mystery, she provides useful information about the town and its residents. At the end of the book, after the mystery is solved and order is restored, Nina attends Katie's storytelling event at the library. During the reception following the program, Nina and Cora find a moment to connect. I'm so glad we got acquainted, Cora said. I'm sorry we don't have more time to get to know each other. Are you planning to attend the Librarians Conference in Oregon this fall? Nina asked. Why, yes, I would plan to go. Me too. How about sharing a room? Cora smiled. I'd like that, Nina. Even in the short time they'd known each other, Nina felt a strong bond with Cora. She had no doubt the friendship would continue to grow and flourish despite the distance that separated them. As I wrote this scene, I suddenly realized I had the setup for another Nina Foster mystery, a librarian's conference in Oregon. Cora and her husband Zell will be there, and so will Stephen. Maybe he will be Nina's official fiancé by then. I don't know yet what the mystery will be, but when the time comes to sit down and write the story, I trust it will be revealed. And all because Cora Springer decided to make an appearance in Deadly Reunion. So thank you all for listening. Please join next time. We're the Cozy Mystery Quartet. Please like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode.